I want you to get ready for what I hope will be the most informative, provocative, and dare I say, exciting 50 minutes of your lives. Because with me on the stage... Are we on the right panel? The most, ex <laughs> most exciting thing is your socks. Where'd you get those? J. Crew. Okay. Um, with me on stage are two of the most successful investors of our time. To my left is Paul Singer. He founded and runs Elliott Management, a multi-strategy hedge fund based in New York City. And to his left is David Rudenstein, the co-chairman and co-founder of the Carlyle Group, a mostly private equity firm based in Washington, DC. But in addition to being successful investors, I want to flag for you something that many of you may already know. These two men are deeply engaged in matters of politics, in matters of philanthropy, broadly speaking, in matters of finance, but they happen to be people who are deeply concerned with the future of our society, and that's why they're on stage with me and before you today. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks. You've probably seen the title of our panel. It has to do with prosperity. We're going to cover a wide range of topics over the course of the next 48 minutes and 17 seconds, but let me begin with this. We live in a curious time in American history. We have what some would describe as a Goldilocks economy. Furthermore, borrowing is cheap. Stock prices are near all-time highs. Yet, at the same time, the inequality divide is the widest in generations. Populism and partisanship have taken over politics. Voter apathy is chronic, and there's a sense that the country is hurtling towards some manifestation of class warfare. Is that the right way to frame the dichotomy? Well, if you want to excite an audience, I guess so, but um, <laughs> I don't know if it's quite that. You don't that... look excitable, David. <laughs> right. Look, at any given opinion. time in American history, uh, any given time, if you were to ask people whether the country is going to go forward or is going to fall apart or the economy is going to go forward or fall apart, you always will find times when it looks bad. It never looks perfect for a very long time. And we have problems, and we've had them from the beginning of the country's uh, history. Today, though, the country is the wealthiest country in the world. Uh, their per capita income is, is about as high as any major developed company a country can have. Uh, we have income disparity that has been with us for a long time. We're doing a better job of measuring it than before. Uh, we're 10 years of prosperity. Uh, generally, you don't have 10 years in a row of prosperity. It only happened one or two times before. So people, I, as I've said, if you're Jewish, you always expect the worst. And so I'm always expecting something bad's going to happen around the corner. And so I've been predicting the recession for the last four years, and it hasn't happened. But eventually, we will have a slowdown. I don't know when it will occur, and I don't think anybody knows. Most economists are very good about telling you why it occurred six months after it occurred, but not really predicting when it would occur. Today, I would say that based on where I think the Federal Reserve is likely to go, which is to lower interest rates the latter part of this year, I think it is likely that we will go through the next presidential election with an economy that is not in recession, and I, unless there's some exogenous events, I think the economy will be reasonably good, but not perfect. I'd like to challenge several of the, um, um, the, several of the premises of the question, uh, as well as the answer uh, that David uh, gave. Um, in an effort uh, to tell you what I believe, but also to be provocative, because that's what um, uh, that's what was requested. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's a Goldilocks economy at all. Uh, and uh, um, let me state the components of um, what I think are the uh, the tee up for the final part of the question about class warfare, which is on the march in formation, so to speak. Uh, and uh, being ginned up by a variety of uh, forces. Um, what, uh, what we have, uh, in, in my view, is a, is a very lengthy process in the developed world, um, including, but not just in the United States, um, of a, a failure and a difficulty to, um, to adapt to the challenges of globalization and technology. Um, and what that actually means is that over a period of several decades, um, the developed world has, has been facing the challenge of 
the rest of the world having an increasingly adept uh, ability to, uh, to perform at very, very high levels, uh, as high as, uh, as Americans and, uh, and Germans and other Europeans. Um, but um, our employer, employees were getting, you know, metaphorically and basically, 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 dollars an hour, uh, and in India and Vietnam and uh, a whole bunch of other places, um, the same services and products um, were uh, generated by people at one or two dollars an hour. Now, there's just no question that globalization, which is the spread of, of uh, economic freedom and prosperity, capitalism, if you will, um, uh, throughout much of the world, has has been so beneficial to not just the developing world, but to the developed world. Um, think of the billion, uh, more than a billion, new customers for all the stuff that, uh, that Americans and uh, Europeans turn out. Um, but of course, it's a double-edged sword. And there's been, a, um, um, there's been this, this, um, this impact on, uh, on jobs. Now, I want to. I want to bring in the, the uh, financial uh, instability uh, into this equation because I think it's, it's very relevant. And what I mean by that is that as the developed world, starting with the United States, the center of innovation, good and bad, um, has become more and more leveraged, more and more um, um, uh, uh, banks um, uh, uh, being really unsound, as we saw in uh, 2006, 7, and 8, um, what, what has happened as a result of the crash of 2007, 2008, is that the response to that crack, um, uh, in which all of our major financial institutions were shown to be unsound, uh, the response has been virtually all monetary. And the monetary authorities, the central banks, the Fed, the ECB, um, the BOJ, they say and they have thought that their policies have been successful and they have held up the global economy. But what they've also done is created a great amount of distortion, tipped the, uh, tipped the table, so to speak. And what I mean by that is that um, there's been a tremendous increase in inequality. It's not the fault of investors in stocks, bonds, and real estate that the prices uh, in the last 10 years or now are, uh, let's call them fake. If you don't like that word, let's call them distorted by public policy. But what you have is as a direct result of the policy mix in which the ability to compete, the ability to deal with uh, globalization, the ability to deal with technological uh, change has not been in the forefront of public policy, um, but this asset price appreciation has, has caused uh, this, um, this growing inequality. And the growing inequality is part of the equation of, um, of this uh, trend towards, if you want to call it populism, you can. But um, the drift away in politics in America and Europe in particular toward the extremes, from the center toward the extremes. And I think that. Um, looks like, and to a large extent is, uh, class warfare. And um, uh, politicians of all stripes in Europe and in America have been feeding on that and, uh, and exacerbating it and encouraging it. What do you think it goes from here? Depends on leadership. Depends on leadership. And um, at the moment, I'm particularly um, uh, pessimistic. Um, and, and the reason I'm pessimistic is that I believe that, uh, that six months ago or so, we got a very important data point about the fragility of the global financial system and the, the, forward, um, the, uh, the forward drift of public policy. What I mean is that in October, November, December 2018, um, a, a rise, uh, you know, it was a catalyst, it wasn't the only thing, but a rise in the US policy rate the U.S. was the only major country which was drifting towards normal or to, in the direction of normal um, uh, uh, monetary policy after 10 years of 0% interest rates, negative interest rates, $20 trillion of money printing uh, being called uh, quantitative easing. 
Um, but the U.S. was drifting towards uh, normalization, and the interest rate had gone over two years, two and a half years, from zero to two and a half percent. Two and a half percent was this trigger for a 20 percent downturn in global stock markets, 15, 20 percent, depending on uh, which market. Um, as a result, um, uh, uh, forces uh, were uh, immediately marshaled uh, to uh, pound on the Fed, pound on the other central banks to uh, uh, go back to easing and uh, the, um, the bond market and the money market um, really in the last few months has, um, has subtracted 150-ish basis points um, from the uh, normalization. And what I believe is that the next round of monetary support for the global economy um, could, uh, could be something that causes a different mix of, of market responses. The last round for 10 years didn't cause um, a, a big explosion in reported consumer inflation. So policymakers, central bankers thought, wow, this is for free, this is magic. We can print money, we can make 0% interest rates, and there's no inflation. And gee, we're going to struggle to get inflation. But um, the next round may not be that way. And I'll give you just one little data point that sort of points a little bit in that direction. Gold. Gold is the money that has stood the test of thousands of years. And gold has peaked its little trodden head above the parapet in the last uh, few weeks and may be a sign that uh, investors may be focusing on monetary debasement. I think that there are some challenges in our economy, uh, income inequality, deficit, debt, um, asset prices are high. I don't see anything cataclysmic happening in the near future. Predicting five or 10 years down the road is impossible. Nobody can really do that. And I'm not saying you try to. But I'm just saying that uh, in the near future, which is where I'm trying to live in the next year or two years or so, what I see is that the Congress of the United States doesn't really have the flexibility to um, cut taxes again. And I don't think that will happen to stimulate the economy. If anything, taxes would be likely increased if the Democrats took control of both houses, I suspect, and there was a Democratic president. But tax policy or fiscal policy is roughly where it is now. The only game in town is really the Fed. And the Fed is likely to lower interest rates probably two or three times uh, this year, if you believe Fed uh, funds futures. And I suspect that will stimulate the economy enough to keep the president uh, feeling OK about the Fed, uh, maybe not loving it, but maybe feeling OK about it. Presidents who run for re-election in a time of recession or perceived uh, recession don't win. My former boss, Jimmy Carter, recession didn't win. Gerald Ford, recession didn't win. And the perception of a recession under George Herbert Walker Bush, he didn't win. When the economy is doing reasonably well and per capita net income is on the rise, presidents tend to get re-elected. And I think people in Washington tend to look at short-term cycles like presidential elections. So everyone in Washington is honestly focused on one thing, which is the presidential election and how long uh, you have to keep the economy going to get through that. And I suspect after the election, whoever is president, you will begin, hopefully, to address some of the serious issues. Social security system more or less is bankrupt. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid has to be addressed. Uh, the deficit has to be addressed. Income quality has to be addressed. Uh, many of these things, infrastructure has to be addressed. Many of these things are being pushed down the road because it's too difficult to deal with them at this current environment. I think after the next presidential election, a Social Security Commission, not unlike we had with, uh, under Ronald Reagan with Alan Greenspan chairing it, I think would be a good idea because we have to address Social Security. And if we don't address it, uh, many people in this room, including me, may not be getting their Social Security checks. Um, now, I don't really think if all of the people in this room didn't collect Social Security, it wouldn't make a difference. I've looked at the numbers, and if the wealthy people in the United States didn't collect their Social Security, this system still has big problems. There just aren't enough wealthy people, to be honest. So we have to address Social Security. When the system was set up, there were 33 workers for every retiree. Now you've got about two and a half workers for every retiree, and the system just can't sustain itself. So we have to address that, but nobody will address that before the election. And I think no serious issue will be addressed before the election that has any um, third rail kind of pot potential like uh, Social Security, unfortunately. I think that um, I agree with, uh, with everything that uh, David just uh, said very, um, very reasonably. Um, but um, uh, I have a different perspective on markets. And I would point out that um, the number of people um, who um, accurately foresaw 
the most important financial crisis since the Depression was very, very, very small. It certainly did not include me, um, uh, although um, uh, it was more practitioners than uh, central bankers or policymakers or academics or economists um, who saw the developing risks. What I believe about today's markets um, is that um, except for the major banks, who, which are in better condition now than they were in 2007 and 2008, um, the, the, the global financial system is um, very much toward the risky end of the spectrum in terms of debt. debt uh, global debt is at an all-time high. Derivatives are at an all-time high. Um, uh, and it took all of this monetary ease to get to where we are today. Um, and I don't think central bankers or policymakers or academics um, or practitioners are in any better shape to predict right. the next downturns. And I think, I think we're at the high end of, uh, uh, of the risk uh, spectrum. So I'm expecting, uh, or I've been expecting, it's not, a, it's not uh, today's um, uh, epiphany, but uh, um, the possibility of a significant uh, market downturn. What does, Look, I think nobody can know for certain, and you're correct. Uh, what your point is, is that last time people didn't ac accurately predict when the recession or the Great Recession was happened, so probably they're not going to be able to predict it right now either. What you'll find, though, is when the Great Recession, a uh, second one comes or recession comes, people will pull out of their files memos that they wrote to somebody or another, maybe to themselves, saying there's a great recession coming, but usually they didn't really go public with it. Right now, the consensus, and the consensus, conventional wisdom, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith said, is usually wrong. But the conventional wisdom today is that we're not heading for a great recession in the near future, but your point is that it can, you know, the people might be wrong. They didn't predict it last time, but I think I'm just telling you what the conventional wisdom is, and that probably nothing cataclysmic is going to happen to the economy in our country until at least after the next presidential election. That would be the conventional wisdom. It would be my view as well. There could be some black swans that come along that could really hurt the economy and maybe could put it into a recession. I don't predict that, but you know, we have a trade war that's extended with China. We have a trade war with Europe that's extended. Brexit turns out to be more difficult for the European economy than we predict. Something uh, goes to, we go to a military kind of confrontation in, in the Middle East. Some of these things could slow the economy down. But right now, we're, the first quarter we grew at 3.1%. The second quarter we'll probably grow at about 1.6%, something like that. So we're growing at a reasonable rate. I don't see the signs of a great recession in the near future, but again, you never can tell what's going to happen in Washington, and things are unpredictable. But right now, I think it's in reasonable shape, but not perfect shape. And I don't like to use the R word. Some of you may have heard me say, when I worked in the White House for President Carter, uh, his inflation advisor, Fred Kahn, used to say, well, we're heading into a recession, perhaps. And Carter hauled him into the Oval Office and said, look, I'm running for re-election. Don't say we're going into a recession. It scares the voters. And so Fred said, well, what am I supposed to do? I've got to be honest. He said, be honest, but don't use the R word. From then on, uh, Fred Kahn said, I think we're heading into a banana. And he used, <laughs> he used the banana word because headline writers wouldn't say Carter's inflation advisor thinks we're heading into a banana. But, so I, don't, I wouldn't say we're heading into a banana, but I would say uh, there's going to be some slowdown, and there is already evidence that the, I think the trade uh, dispute with China is slowing the Chinese economy a bit, slowing the Asian economy a bit, and slowing our economy a bit. And we will not grow as well in the second half of this year as I think we're going to grow in the first half of this year. Paul, you use the word significant, right, to, to describe what you think might happen in terms of a market correction. Could you put some color around significant, perhaps tell us what you think? If, if the downturn that you foresee, in fact, comes, what does it look like? Um, I, I think there's a rich array of, uh, of considerations when uh, talking about that, and I'm not going to filibuster. Um, but I just want to say, I, I, David, I wasn't, okay. um, I didn't mean to, uh, to say, and I don't think I said, that the mere uh, inability okay. to protect, uh, pre uh, predict, predict that recession is a sign that things are unpredictable in life. Um, okay. What I meant to convey is that um, um, they never are predicted and predictable right. because it's mass human social behavior, um, not um, uh, quantifiable, um, uh, okay. modelable behavior. But also that today and uh, currently, the, um, the landscape is at or above the risk levels 
that they were back then. Um, and That's so, a very good point. Let me just add in one second. Some people sure. forget this. At the time before the Great Recession, the total indebtedness in the United States was 240% of GDP. A large part of that was personal indebtedness. Today, the indebtedness of the United States is 240% of GDP. It's just we've shifted it from people to the government. The government, government state governments and federal governments have just taken on an enormous amount of additional debt. Sorry. So um, I want to put boundaries or put some shape around the answer to your question. Um, and uh, I hate physical metaphors, but I'm going to trot one out. Um, and that is, um, you know, in forest management, um, if your philosophy is to let stuff, is to prevent fires, and uh, just, you know, uh, just whatever fires uh, um, uh, break out, just rush and suppress them. What you end up doing is suppressing the damage from today's fire and tomorrow's fire, whatever. But what you do sometimes is build the potential for a very large fire. Um, if what you do is paper over growing risks by um, monetary ease and building and building the um, the, um, the riskiness of financial markets in price, forward rate of return, leverage, um, what you're doing is possibly um, uh, augmenting the, the, um, the possibility of an ultimate uh, downturn. What we have today um, is, uh, what you have uh, historically, and none of them have been predicted by the experts and the gurus. What you have is every four years, roughly speaking, since basically World War II, um, you have stock market downturns of 20 to 30, and in a couple of cases, 50 percent. Um, uh, and that's been suppressed for the last 10, 11 years. Um, and what you have is recessions every once in a while. What you have today is, I think, the longest bull market in American history. It's, I don't know, 120 months or something. That's right. I don't know, whatever it is. Um, so when I look at, just as a risk manager, because I'm a practitioner, I'm not an economist, um, uh, uh, the parameters of what a downturn might be from surprises. It has to come from surprises because we know that the presidents and prime ministers are desperate to avoid a crash, desperate to avoid a financial crisis. Janet Yellen, the former chair of the Fed, is actually quoted as saying that there'll never be another financial crisis in our lifetimes. Um, and Larry Kudlow, uh, a senior advisor, said just a couple of months ago that um, he felt that there would never be a rise in interest rates again in our lifetimes. Something, I mean, he well, really, really said something like that. So for me, um, I, for me, somewhere between, because I want to answer, I, 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 guess I, I want I, not to be I, a I don't want to be. 30 to 40 percent, well, something let's, like that. Let's That's not what you depress everybody too much. I think we're depressing people here. No, they um, paid to be depressed. Okay, maybe they want to be depressed. Okay, it's not, it, we're, it's not so bad. And I would remind people, we have recessions every seven years on average in the United States, and now we're going 10 years without a recession. So we're, quote, due for one by normal standards. But recessions are not normally the great recession. And uh, the, the lesson of the last recession, if you're an investor, was by and large, if you weren't over levered, you could ride it out and basically bought your own debt back at a discount. You could make a lot of money. You bought your equity back at a discount sometimes. You could make more money. You could put more equity in. So there was a lot of uh, good things that happened for some investors out of the Great Recession. I don't want a Great Recession, but I don't want to make it sound like the world has, is going to fall apart and the U.S. as we know it won't survive if we go into a recession. So I don't want people to leave here thinking that all of a sudden your net worth is going to go down 50 percent in the next year or two or three. It's not going to happen. The markets will bounce back in part because we have such a vibrant economy and we have so many great resources in this country. So you know, I would be more worried if I was a, you know, an emerging market country or frontier country, they're going to have a harder time bouncing back from a kind of a, a modest recession or even a great recession. I agree. And um, one of the reasons you just saw, one of the reasons David has had such a wonderful and successful career is his, his balance and maturity. So, <laughs> um, and I'm not being uh, ironic there, I, uh, I agree with you. Um, but I just want to uh, include a couple of other elements of how the next time could be somewhat different in a, um, in a very scary way. Um, they, they, the central bankers, got away with, um, uh, with something um, by this extreme, the most extreme monetary policy in history, um, by not being punished. It was only good. 
This, the economies uh, were supported. The U.S. has um, a very low uh, unemployment. Uh, even before uh, President Trump got into office, uh, it was low, and then it got uh, somewhat lower. Um, but nobody's really focusing on inflation. I thought you weren't going to mention the T word. I lied. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, nobody is really focusing. And when I say nobody, um, we have a lot of inv institutional investors in, uh, in Elliott. Um, and people are just not orienting their portfolios uh, toward the possibility of a significant uh, increase in inflation. And one of the things that may happen in the next round of monetary ease is a different uh, co confluence of, uh, of factors and, and responses. Um, you may get uh, actual inflation. You may get gold and commodities um, um, roaring uh, as a result of the, the next rounds of monetary ease. If there is inflation and the bond market um, has a tumble, um, stocks uh, could uh, be uh, on a, uh, you know, sort of on a tether to the bond market. And so um, I, think, uh, I think most investors feel that they know the shape of the, uh, if there's adversity, that they know the shape of it because they've seen it uh, and it's okay. They can survive it. Okay, well, but if, you, if there is an adversity coming forward, the thing that people should do is read books. Now, um, is that right? Barnes and Noble would be a good thing, right? So um, people should go out and buy a lot of books, stock up for books David, because the David, economy we, is going down. We haven't down. closed the deal yet. Oh, you haven't? Okay. Oh, so the price might get higher. Okay, don't go read books yet. Wait until the price goes down. Okay. Browse. Browse. Right, okay. Browse. Browse. But be ready to buy books soon. Because the best way to get through a recession is reading books. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> no, the best way to get through a recession is turning off your quote screen. OK. OK. Do you have another question? I, I do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to go back to the Fed, because, David, you mentioned earlier that uh, if you believe the market, there will be two or three rate cuts between now and the end of the year. That's what the market suggests. Right. Uh, Paul, as we have already heard, you've been critical of Fed policy in the past. What do you think the Fed should do? I, I have been a critical of Fed policy. And um, for some time, I've felt that um, those small number of practitioners who have felt that um, the Fed and the other central banks are trapped, um, uh, and, and I'll, say, I'll say what I mean by that, um, I think they're right, and uh, December sort of supported that. I, no, more than sort of. December supported the notion that they're trapped. Two and a half percent, with wow. Europe still under zero, Japan still way under zero um, in terms of the policy rate. Um, I saw on my screen this morning um, the European 30-year swap is 74 basis points, 30 years. Austria, I think yesterday or today, sold or extended something, a 100-year bond at an interest rate of 1.17, 100 years. Some of you may not be around to see the maturity uh, of that, uh, of that uh, bond. So, Will they be uh, around to uh, see the default? <laughs> um, there's a lot of different ways to uh, default. But um, so what I think, um, and uh, I. I've tried to convey this to the central bankers that, I, uh, that uh, we're acquainted with. Um, I think what they should have done and what they should do now is, is try to restore um, the soundness and the, the, um, the, um, the soundness of money. They should not be cutting rates um, uh, right now. Um, they should be calling on the, um, the congresses and uh, parliaments around the developed world to take steps to deal with, um, with um, uh, the, the, um, the uh, economic, let's call it, um, you know, slow down in growth uh, that's, that's seeming to be in the data around the world. Um, You're talking think, about think, structural think, measures. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'd say, look, the Federal Reserve was created in 1917. Uh, it was um, 
you know, we didn't have a central bank for much of our country's history. We had one at the beginning, Alexander Hamilton wanted one, it went out of existence, and then we had another one, the second one, and then uh, Andrew Jackson got rid of it. And we didn't really have a central bank. And clearly, we need one. And it was started in 1917. It was set up in a bizarre way so that no one person can have that much power and so forth. And it's supposed to be independent. I think they've done a reasonably good job of being independent. But I, I think the Fed did a heroic job when we had the Great Recession. Uh, ben Bernanke went to Capitol Hill and explained that the economy was going to collapse. And they came up with TARP. TARP wasn't perfect, but I think it did enable us to get out of the recession more rapidly and better than Europe did and the other parts of the, of the world did. So I wouldn't say it was perfect, but I think they did a reasonably good job. Maybe they continued quantitative easing too long, and that's, I think, is part of your point, right? Well, um, emergency policy in 2009 right. Right. was, we would agree, was uh, entirely appropriate. But 11 years of emergency policy is, so, is not uh, appropriate. We, you know, historically we've had uh, PhDs in economics head the Fed. Now we have a private equity person from my firm. So what could be better than private equity training to be the head of the Fed? I think Jay Powell is, is a very smart person. He has more of a political background, investment bank background than, than prior chairs. But I think he's very attuned to Congress and very attuned to what public is thinking. But in the end, the staff at the Fed has so much power because they analyze the data and generally the uh, FOMC, which makes the decisions on interest rates, they kind of rely on what the staff is telling them and depends on what the data is. And the data is suggesting, I suspect, that the economy is slowing down. You may be right that we should ha have some medicine now and just let the economy slow down and maybe take a recession. Maybe that would be a good thing. I think that people in Washington generally view recessions as things they're trying to push down the road, certainly past presidential elections. And I suspect that you'll see uh, the rate cuts occur because I think the policy that you would like maybe is the right policy, but I don't think the people making the policy now are interested in going in that direction. I think they want to keep the economy going. I'm not in favor of the economy falling into recession, right. and I'm not in favor right. of letting the economy uh, slow down. What I am in favor of is changing the policy mix um, toward the uh, elements of policy that have been uh, ignored, and part of what is causing uh, anger, frustration among the middle classes in, uh, in the United States and the rest of the so, developed world. Um, and so, um, what, let's do a thought experiment ju for just a moment. Um, so, um, they cut 50 basis points next month, which is the widespread That's correct. general expectation. Um, but let's say that this, uh, this um, United States and China um, struggle, let's call it, which basically a lot of people around the world are uh, cheering America on in some fashion, in some low-key fashion or not. Um, let's say that China, who, um, uh, which has um, uh, not only generated so much wealth for hundreds of millions of its people, but has generated debt, bad debt, corruption, uh, um, sort of ex uh, extremes and, um, uh, and distortions. Let's say China actually from the swing generator of growth in the world turns into a negative. Um, so the thought experiment is, what is the Fed, what do the central banks do at that point? Um, that's, wow. what, that's what concerns me. They're starting with zero and negative interest rates. Um, so uh, so uh, Jay uh, cuts from two and a quarter to one and three quarters. Um, and then what happens? Well, let me try to answer it this way. Right now, the, the heaviest, um, burden on the U.S. economy, leaving income inequality aside and other things like that, is what's going to happen in China, the China trade agreement or the non-trade agreement. I am 100 percent convinced there will be a trade agreement because I think Xi Jinping needs a trade agreement because his economy is slowing down and it's perceived that the U.S. problems are, are one of the reasons. And the U.S. economy, I think, is slowing down a bit. We're beginning to see some evidence of slowdown, consumer orders, I mean, uh, business orders and business investment is slowing down. So I do think that you're going to uh, have an incentive by the administration to get this worked out as well. I think President Trump is going to be meeting with uh, Xi Jinping in Osaka, and I do think that they won't resolve the deal, but I think they'll make a lot of progress to be done by the end of the year. There are three parts of the deal. One is the Chinese buying more of our goods, and I think there's a gap between what we've asked for and what the Chinese are willing to do, but I think that's manageable. The second part is the Chinese opening their markets to us, and that's probably manageable. They're not probably going to open as much on, 
on uh, cloud computing and maybe pharmaceuticals, but they will open their markets a bit more. And that third part is the toughest part, is our telling the Chinese they can't do certain things in, in uh, G5 and, and, uh, and, and certain things in uh, uh, other air, artificial intelligence. We're trying to dictate a bit, uh, some people would say, how they're going to structure their economy. The Chinese have resisted that. We've called it reneging on an earlier agreement, but the Chinese are, are resisting some of that. But I do think there will be enough there so that when the deal is done, it will be the greatest trade deal of all time. And uh, the biggest problem, to be serious about it, is that if either side says it's the greatest trade deal of, either t of all time, it will make the other side feel that they can't go ahead with it. So they've got to very carefully manage what they say about it, because you can't say it's the greatest trade deal of all time for the United States and ask Xi Jinping to uh, accept that, because his people won't accept it. China is not Mexico. China has been around for thousands of years. They've got a big population, and Xi Jinping can withstand um, another year or two of this if he has to. So I think we can't brag about it, and I think Xi Jinping can't do the same. He can't say, look what, how great a deal I got for our, my people, because that's not going to work in our country. So if they manage the public relations, I think by the end of the year there will be a trade deal. And if that happens, I do think the, the, there'll be a, a burden lifted off of our economy a bit. David has just articulately and intelligently outlined one uh, interpretation of the path forward between the United States and China. Let me outline a second one. Um, um, and uh, the second interpretation, possible interpretation, is based upon a theory, uh, which we will see soon enough if the theory is correct or not correct, um, that it's much more than trade uh, and um, uh, buying American products that lies um, uh, um, at the root of what the American administration uh, is trying to do. It is true that the president is a deal maker, but those um, who say he wants to announce a deal and it, uh, wants to announce a victory may be missing the strategic part of the, of the equation. And the strategic part is China has basically in an unfettered way in the last, let's call it 30 years, 30 or 40 years, um, um, uh, been at liberty on the national security side, on the uh, intellectual property side, not just stealing intellectual property, that's widely uh, believed and known uh, throughout the Western world, but voluntary. You do a deal with China, with a Chinese company, you, as, a, as, a, as a condition of the deal, you have to surrender, um, which um, uh, most American and uh, European companies have done to get deals done. Um, you have to surrender a bunch of IP voluntarily. Um, and so on the national security, the national economic security side, um, um, and uh, uh, sort of on a, on a uh, gestalt uh, level, this is a, possibly a strategic struggle. And it's the first pushback to China. And China is, at the moment, possibly very surprised and doesn't really know how to, uh, how to deal with it. Yes, um, the, right. the leader of China is a leader for life, and uh, he has his own um, um, uh, uh, dignity and, uh, and power base to, uh, uh, to worry about. So um, I, think we, I, I think which of these paths uh, is, uh, is really the, um, the root of the goals of the United States. The United States' goals are likely to be governing the broader economic and geopolitical outcomes. For relating to that, there was a book that came out not long, not long ago by Graham Allison, a professor at the Kennedy School. It's called The Thucydides Trap. And the essence of it is that when you have a rising economic power throughout the last several thousand years challenging a dominant economic power, in most cases, they go to war. In some cases, they haven't, but in some cases, they do. World War II was a case of that. Uh, we were here, and Japan was rising. We ultimately went to war with Japan and so forth. Um, his view is we don't really know whether we'll go to war with China, but China is rising, and very often the power at the top resents it, and they go to war. I don't actually think we're going to go to a military war with China, but I do think even if we get the trade agreement, which I think we will get, you will see increasingly, as we're now seeing in other parts of the world, uh, war through cyber. Uh, when the United States did not respond recently with the military means in what happened in Iran, we responded with cyber attacks. And increasingly, you're going to see 
uh, more and more cyber attacks as a way to avoid military confrontation and avoid killing people but damaging economies. And I suspect we, when we reach agreement with China, as I think we will, we will not eliminate um, uh, all disputes with them. And we, I suspect we won't go to any military confrontation. But I do think we will probably have some cyber uh, confrontations over the years with China, as they're, you know, it's rare in the history of the world that the two biggest economies in the world, the two most dominant political and military powers, uh, get along that well. It usually doesn't happen. The fact that we're getting along reasonably well, or we haven't gone to military war, is, I think, a, a positive. David, I'm glad you used the word suspect, because I have a strong suspicion that people in the audience may have questions for our panelists. There are mic runners in the room. There's a hand going up already. Please make sure, folks, that it's a question not a statement. This is a question I'd just like to ask for your reaction to uh, the democratic uh, policies of disrupting business, including the health insurance industry, the um, <clears throat> technology industry, breaking up companies, et cetera, in the technology business, and the pharma business. Thank you. When you have 23 candidates, um, or 30 candidates, whatever you have, and I should point out, there's nobody running from the private equity industry. Um, so it's a sad thing. There's nobody running. Uh, I know there's a great demand for somebody from private equity to run, but so far nobody's shown up. When you have 30 candidates running, your main mission is to get people to listen to you and to get above the fray. So say anything that will get a headline, and you get above the fray. So uh, people are saying a lot of things that are going to get attention, get headlines. It's not realistic that they're going to be implemented, even if they won, and they don't necessarily believe all the things they're talking about. So I listen to the things that they're saying. I'm not that worried about them, because I don't think a lot of them are realistic. They aren't going to get done. But it does show, in my view, that the, that the center of the Democratic Party has drifted left. And I think it's, you know, that could be damaging to them if they nominate somebody who's too far to the left, because the business community uh, they may not like the incumbent Republican, but I think the business community and a lot of the middle class people who are in the business world will say, I just can't tolerate some of these things to the far left. So I think you've got to be careful. When, my, when Jimmy Carter ran for the nomination in 1976, many of you may, not, may remember this, maybe many of you don't, he was the, he was the, the moderate candidate. There was Scoop Jackson and, and, uh, and Jimmy Carter. Everybody else was far to the left. And all the left-leaning people killed each other out until Carter was left standing. Uh, you might find the same thing here. All the left-leaning people will kind of knock each other out, not get anywhere. In the end, you might have one moderate, and whoever the moderate turns out to be, Joe Biden or somebody else, has a pretty good chance of, of, of doing better in an election than somebody on the left side. At least that's my view. Um, I've been surprised by the um, trends that the question um, um, uh, uh, asked about, um, because um, there are extremists on both left and right in American uh, politics. But I believe that the center of gravity of the Republican Party and the conservative movement um, um, haven't really changed very much, um, uh, hasn't changed very much. But the center of gravity of the Democratic Party, even the ones that are labeled as moderates or centrists or whatever, has moved significantly left. And I'm also surprised that um, economic freedom, um, you could call it capitalism, but uh, economic freedom in the quest for shared prosperity, broad prosperity, has clearly won the ideological and practical battle uh, in, um, in world systems of how governments and peoples ought to be uh, organized. Um, to be called into question uh, in such a deep and profound way, not just by the most extreme, but buy-in from um, uh, the more toward the center of the um, the left in America and in Europe is a surprise to the me. The word capitalism is a word that many people are afraid to utter. In other words, many people who are liberal do not like to use the word liberal anymore. They use the word progressive. And think about words. We, did, we used to use the word pork barrel. We don't call things pork barrel. It's infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to um, say they have a tactical way to get something done. It's strategic. And the same thing is true on capitalism. People don't want to say they're a capitalist. So if this was renamed the, a the Aspen Capitalist Festival, how many of you would have shown up? OK, how many of you would have refused to show up? Anybody? Well, there are a lot of people who probably wouldn't have shown up, if we're being honest, because the capitalism has gotten to be a bad word. Uh, liberal is a word that some people are afraid to use. The word that used is progressive. 
Everybody, who's in favor of, who, who actually identify themselves as a liberal here? How many like to say they're progressive? How many are capitalists? Wow, okay. Maybe we should call it the Aspen Capitalist Festival. I don't know. <laughs> how, how about another this question? This is a confused audience. Right, okay. Uh, there, this hand went up right here first, I think. We have a, well, we have a mic there for the moment, so we'll go with that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rubenstein, you made a reference to our uh, level of debt at 240% uh, percent of our GDP 10 years ago, mostly private debt, and currently in public debt. Historically, the leverage has been our challenge and a risk in the economy, given the fact that a uh, significant part of our current debt is in the form of government debt, right. and uh, government doesn't, doesn't have the mark-to-market requirement. What is the risk there? All right, let me, let me try to address it this way. Some of you may have heard of something called modern monetary theory. Anybody heard of this? Anybody not know what it is? Anybody not heard of this? All right, this is a theory, it's a theory, that in the end, you can, if you're in a developed economy like ours and you, and you have a currency, which everybody wants, uh, you can print as much dollars as you want and borrow as much money as you want, and it's really not a big problem. And therefore, the fact that we have $22 trillion of debt, we're adding about $1.3 trillion a year, the states have about $4 trillion of debt, uh, and nobody is under modern uh, monetary theory is supposed to worry about it that much, relatively speaking. I, I don't agree with that. I think that we are running into a problem by borrowing so much money. And uh, you know, when, when this country was started, we had $70 million of debt. We actually moved our capital to the, to the south so that the uh, southern states would agree to pay off the northern debt, more or less. And we've had debt pretty much ever since we've had um, our country. Under Bill Clinton, we were paying down debt so rapidly there was a worry that we wouldn't have any treasury bills any, anymore to measure against, uh, against, against which corporate debt could be measured. We don't have that problem anymore. We now are running debt at about, at increasing about 1.3 trillion or something like that a year. I am worried about this, and I think the modern, moder modern monetary theory, while it's proposed by many very smart people, I do think it's very dangerous, and we should worry about this, and I don't know why we aren't worried about it. And the point you're making about the dollar, we're devaluing the currency by borrowing all this money. Now, we don't have a sovereign wealth fund in this country. We're the only country in the world that practically doesn't have one. But we have one. It's called the printing press. We just keep printing money, and that's our sovereign wealth fund. And so amazingly, people around the world will pay Anything, we'll buy our debt for 1% interest, 2% interest. I don't know how long that can continue, but if there is another reserve currency in the next five or 10 years, we're gonna have a big problem because we're the only reserve currency now, and that's why people are buying our debt. I worry about modern monetary theory taking too much uh, of the uh, attention away from the idea we have to pay down our debt. Two points, um, two quick points uh, in uh, response to this. One is mo modern monetary theory is an excuse for lack of spending discipline and excuse uh, for, um, uh, for uh, um, uh, lack, of, uh, lack of attention to choices. Societies and people should have to make choices in spending. The notion that all you have to do is print money is basically crazy. Uh, um, the, um, the other thing, you, you said 240 and, and David was talking about 240, Percent. which is now 280 or something right. like that, 290. Right. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that that doesn't include the unfunded entitlements. And the reason I include, which brings it to five, six hundred percent of GDP, um, the reason I include that in the definition of, uh, or in the concept of debt and uh, out of control debt is because there has been no uh, discernible uh, willingness of societies in the United States, Europe, to make any changes to the long-term entitlements. And so I think they are the effective equivalent of debt. Yes, I agree. That is the, the biggest problem. Uh, when President Trump ran, he said he wasn't gonna change any of that, and he has honored that commitment. At some point, whoever the next president is, is going to have to address this issue. We just, the, the demographics are killing us. We're, it's great to live longer, all of us are living longer, but when we're living longer, we're collecting Social Security for a longer period of time. When Social Security was established, at, you could retire at the age of 65. The, at, the life expectancy in the United States then was 65. <laughs> Today, the life expectancy for, let's say, uh, it depends on demographics, but let's say 80 or so, um, and if you get to be 65, your life expectancy is probably closer to 90. Uh, people are living so much longer. Uh, right now in the United States, 
we have 14% of the population is 65 or older, and 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every single day. And at some point, uh, we just can't afford the system of entitlements for people like me. How many people here, I'm just curious, I, I'm going to turn an age soon where I can collect Social Security. And I've been debating in my own mind, should I collect it or not? I don't need Social Security. And many of you probably don't need it. How many people here who are eligible for Social Security actually collect it? How many people say, I don't need it, I'm not collecting it? Wow, OK. Usually I find that most people say, I'm entitled to it, I want it. And this is pretty much what people say here. I'm trying to figure out, you know, if I turn it over to the federal government, it's not going to make a big di difference in the debt, so I don't know what to do with it. But I guess I'll give it to the Aspen, uh, uh, Aspen Institute or something, OK? Um, I think applause is appropriate. I wish we had more time for questions. I told you these two were deeply engaged, thoughtful, and had a lot to say. They certainly did. Thank Please you. join me in thanking David Rubenstein and Paul Singer. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.